If you're visiting, I just want to say welcome. And we don't always show a lot of videos. I've got a really quick clip here I'd like you to see. If you're ready with that film. And everybody pay close attention for 60 seconds. I prayed about the vision of the church, I just kept hearing the Lord say, this is your mission, should you choose to accept it. Because I want you to understand that sometimes people feel in, in the body of Christ, and I know I'm, I'm speaking to the really committed people here, we've got so many people gone today, and I'm so glad you're here. But when, when we choose to accept the perfect will of God for our lives, it's a commitment that says, I choose this calling over every other, other calling that I live for. And I don't want to be too melodramatic at the beginning, but I want to talk to you about the vision of the church because the vision of the church is something that I believe is worth laying down your life for. And if I didn't, I wouldn't be here, okay? And go to Matthew 16. I'll explain better later. But I, I want to make it clear that some people think that, well, you know, the Lord can guide me. I'll just end up in the will of God. It's been my experience that the only people who end up doing the perfect will of God are those who have a deep passion. And we're not being too heavy here, right? Listen, I figure you're here because you love God. Because you want to make your life count. But the Bible says that to find the perfect will of God, it has to be your great desire to do it. Okay? The reason our family ended up here, we, didn't, we never heard of a place called Fulton Beach, Virginia. 1984, we were looking for the will of God just in praying, and God led us here. And I just believe that every single Christian has a church that they're called to, a vision that they're called to, and the purpose of that vision is to advance the kingdom of God on earth just as far as is possible through them. Let's look at Jesus and what he says about the church in Matthew 16, if you'll turn, turn there in your Bibles. It's a familiar passage, but he says a lot in a few verses here. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Is there a lot of disagreement in our society about who Jesus is? Yes, there really is. A lot of debate over whether you're supposed to obey him or not. Amen? Verse 15, he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Real quick question here, did Peter get that revelation straight from heaven? Yeah. Can you get revelation from heaven? Can you hear from heaven? Absolutely. I'm going to try to help you see today that the spiritual realm is very, very near to us. And God wants us to live under an open heaven. Look at verse 18. He, uh, the Lord continues. He said, let's read 17 again. Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What is the rock he's talking about? He's talking about the revelation. You were the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the whole church is not built on a person. Not on St. Peter. Not on Pope. Not, not on any human being. But on the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The reason that the church did not collapse 17 years ago when my husband had founded the church 
pastored. When he died, he did not lead, take the church with him because the church was not built on him or his personality. The church was built on the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay? Hallelujah. Your life will be built on revelation of the Word. That's the solid foundation. Now, another thing from this verse is, are the gates of hell offensive or defensive weapons? It says the gates of hell will not overpower the church. If, do you build a gate for an offensive weapon or a defensive weapon? is defense. Yep. If hell's on the defense, who's on the offense? On. The church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be on the offense. In God's sight, we are to be a war club, it says in Jeremiah. We'll get there in a minute. Here's the question. Did Jesus intend to build a powerful church? You know, right now, most of, most of America is talking about how the church is in decline. Memberships are fading. Doors are closing. But God does not see the church of Jesus Christ in decline. God sees a powerful church that was meant to overcome the evil one for the sake of the lost. Amen. Look at verse 19. <coughs> Jesus continues. Just read it with me. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Who is supposed to have the keys to the kingdom of heaven? Raise your hand. Amen. We have authority. When a spirit of darkness comes against a family, a person that you love, you, you have the keys of heaven to take dominion, to bind or to loose. It says what you bind is bound and what you loose is loosed. Um, what do you think of the church? In the sight of God, the church is the place you go to have your life changed. Now, my guess is that if you ask Christians across all the United States of America, how do you see the church? Why do you go to church? I don't know that that many people would say, well, I expect to go to church with a problem and leave without it. You see, God does not want you walking in with a heartache and walking out with a heartache. You're not supposed to walk in with, out with the same backache you walked in or the same marriage ache or even the same financial ache because you're... Okay, I'm going to talk about the powerful church that Jesus sees. In Jeremiah 51, is where he calls us a war club. He says, you are my war club my weapon of war, and with you I shatter nations, and with you I destroy kingdoms. God wants a church here so powerful that we are able to bust an opening in heaven that opens the heavens over this place, that makes it easy access. Yeah. I can tell you so many people have had their lives totally changed coming to this church. Mm -hmm. And it isn't the person, and it, it is the open access that we have to heaven, and God wants yeah. to make it stronger. Now, if we are a war club, a war club doesn't do much sitting on a shelf. If you're a war club, you're not much by yourself, sorry. <laughs> How many of you can agree with that? But you put the war club in the hand of a mighty warrior, the Lord Jesus Christ, he can do something with it. And God Amen. wants this church to be a war club to shatter kingdoms and nations, but those are spiritual kingdoms and spiritual nations. The church that God has envisions for this place is to have a powerful anointing on every individual life, and corporately as a body. Can I tell you something? If you come to this church, you're not supposed to be afraid of nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Would Jesus be Jesus if he walked around and the devil acted out in the service and he said, Ooh! Is that the Jesus you know? No. no. Are Christians supposed to go, Ooh! No, Christians are supposed to go, Who do you think you are? Shut up and get out of this place. Amen. You're supposed to have a conquering anointing on you. You're supposed to have access to heaven at all times and such a powerful access that you can get anybody around you that needs help. How many of you had somebody in your life that they had such a prayer power that you could turn to them and get help? I know I have. Thank God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now the truth is, we're talking about the church this morning. We already have a powerful enough flow from heaven to earth to live in victory ourselves. When Chris faced this the other night, Listen, we knew we were in trouble if without help from God. It could go wrong. Yeah. But you know what? We sent out a prayer alert. I, the, the email prayer chain is one of the best things. If you're not on it and you want to be on it, tell me. It's one of the best things that we ever started. Because when you get this whole body of believers praying in agreement for something, it's very odd for us not to get it. It's like 98% of the time. Thank God. We already have a powerful enough flow, heaven to earth, to live in victory ourselves. But God's vision for the church, you see, 
When somebody says, we'll share the vision for the church, usually it's how many buildings are we going to build and what programs. But the truth of the matter is we're never going to build another building unless the move of God necessitates it. God's not worried about the building. We're all worried about the building. I'm worried about the land. I'm worried about the building. This is, you, you get a move of God going that necessitates oh another building, it'll be. Yeah. Isn't this interesting? Hallelujah. We think naturally. God thinks spiritually. Sure. Hallelujah. Go to 2 Kings 6. My goal today is to help you see the open communication between heaven and earth that is portrayed all the way through the Bible. <coughs> I have a stack of books in my office that I brought out, or that I plan to bring out in stacks, and every one of them describes a powerful revival that you and I probably don't know about. Wow. And you say, why is that? Because we don't, we haven't been taught church history. Right. Yeah. There's tremendous moves of God in history that we and I just don't know about because it's world, you know, CNN is not going to tell you. No, nor is, you know, MSNBC or a whole list of news sources that you and I hear about. God has always been willing and able to move any time in history where God's people put a demand on his power. Hallelujah. Now we're going to read this part real quickly here to show that God wants his people to live under an open heaven. And you remember this passage, Elisha, the prophet, has been telling the king of Syria, isn't this interesting? Who did Israel have to bomb in our Iranians and Syria? It's still the same old war going today. The king of Syria has been attacking Israel, and every single time the king of Syria would come, it, Elisha would tell the king of Israel, hey, by the way, don't go that way, they're coming. He gave, he read their email. He was the one man, at, what do you call the NSA, right? National Security Agency, all right? And then finally the king of Syria looked at his leaders and said, who's the snitch? What? Only four of us knew, and somebody told. And I said, it wasn't us. It's that prophet down there. He oh. tells the king of Israel what you speak in your bedroom. You whisper something in your bedroom. Okay, I remember the story. Uh -huh. yeah. And so what did they do to the prophet? They said, go get him. So when Elisha gets up that morning, there's all the army of Assyria surrounding a town named Dothan. Okay? Right. And when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and got out, behold, an army horses and chariots was circling the city. And a servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Don't fear. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And the, you know, the servant looks at Elisha and says, One, two. That's two. You know? But Elisha had inside information. And then Elisha prayed and said, Oh Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around. Now, I'm, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Were these horses and chariots of fire real? Come on. Okay. Did they come from hell? Yeah. No. no. Did they come from earth? No. Where did those horses and chariots of fire come from? They came from heaven. I'm going to try to break down the barrier in your mind that thinks heaven's a long ways away. Right. And there's a big wall between here and heaven. There is not a big wall between you and here and heaven. No, there is not. We see, every, we, I want to give you a whole list of people that they just cross, it's just continual help back and forth. Jacob saw the ladder that goes back and forth. Angels ascending and descending. Because until you get to where you're getting help for people when you're not desperate. You see, when you're desperate, oh, mamas, this is mamas day. You know who knows how to pray? Mamas, something about mamas, they will go after God and get a prayer answered for their baby. Yeah, that's right. And they don't have anybody to tell them, hurry up and do it hard and do it fast. They know how to pray hard and pray fast. But God wants us to love this town as much as we love our babies. And so you got a problem? Come over here. We can get you some help. Now, I lost all the enthusiasm on that. Just hang in there. Because if you hear this long enough and hard enough, you're going to understand that when Jesus came, he had an open window, not just for his mama and his half-brothers and sisters. He had an open window over his life for anybody, anywhere that was ever born, deaf, lame, blind, and in need. Is heaven, we're going to talk about these horses and chariots of fire, is heaven a real place? And I listen, everybody here thinks, I know all this. Okay, if you know, I'm not going to say anything insulting. <laughs> Aren't you glad that I'm not going to say anything? The truth is... God ordained for the church of Jesus Christ to be a powerhouse where anybody that ever needed a miracle could go and get a miracle. And that is not how the American people seek the church of Jesus Christ. 
They don't respect God because they don't fear God, and they don't fear God because they've never seen the miracle. Right. I'm asking you, is heaven a real place? Yes. Are you, are people you and I, that you and I know and love, are they living a real life there, free from the hassles of this world? Is it real to you that heaven is a very real place? We've sent people from this church that I will, I cannot wait to see again. Pastor Gordon and Emily and Diane, or, or not Diane, Kathy. I mean, there's people in heaven. And they're not vegetating. They're not, I never have gone to the cemetery to visit my husband's grave one time. That's awesome. He's not there. But he is somewhere. And he's alive and well in heaven. And until heaven becomes real to you, we will live powerless lives. Does heaven have access to planet Earth? Yes. Now we, you say, well, I don't know if heaven has. Well, let me ask you something. How many of you believe the Bible just the way it's written? You believe that when Elisha said, you see, Elisha didn't see those chariots of fire. You said, well, how did he know that? Let me ask you this. How did Elisha's mentor go to heaven? Does anybody remember? Who was Elisha's mentor? He was the protege of Elijah. Remember, there's a scripture, 2 Kings 2, 11, it tells how Elijah, the one who mentored him, went to heaven. Yeah. It says, as they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared oh, a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which have separated the two of them. Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Yeah. Now listen to me carefully. The person that you allow to mentor you will enormously affect what you have faith for. When I, when I started going to Al Fury's church, I had always been in a church where I knew exactly what was going to happen in every service. I knew, you know, every service. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I was going to a church where you never knew what was going to happen in any service. <laughs> and guess what's more fun? Uh, it is more fun. I mean, my sister, 15, going through a terrible time, thinking about just walking away from God. And I was believing God for it, but I couldn't help her. Al Fury had his pastor in Ray Bloomfield from New Zealand. Called my sister Lisa out, read her mail, talked to her, told her things, and in that moment he said, Honey, you are beloved of your mom and dad, but you're more beloved of God. And he told her things, and that attack of Satan snapped off of her, and she never walked away from God. Hallelujah. And you say, Was it valuable? Uh, you, I wouldn't have taken $10 million to <laughs> You say, you're lying. No, I'm not. A person's walk with God is so much more important than $10 million. Money comes, money goes. All your life you're going to see money coming and money going. Money is fleeting. Money is not what you build your life on. You build your life on your walk with God. So here's my point. When I ask you, does heaven have access to earth? And you pause. The real question is, is the Bible true? Right. Because if the Bible is true, we know heaven has access to church. Because if you go back to the other scripture that we just read in 2 Kings 6, it says that the, all of Dothan was surrounded by two armies. One was in the natural, it was the army of Syria. But above that, there was an army from God. And it, did it come from hell? No. no. Did it come from earth? No. So where did it come from? Heaven. Now I'm asking you one more time. Does heaven have access to work. At times it does. Now the question is, who opens the access points? And you say, is this an important message? It is to me. It increased my faith. Hallelujah. In this instance, this is the question I ask you, whose life and faith gave these fiery horses and chariots of fire access to planet Earth? Somebody must know. Who, who gave them access? Elisha, the man of God, the prophet. Your faith and your prayers at one point or another have opened heaven. If you're born again, you reach past the veil of heaven and earth. and you were, It says you're born from above. This is your citizenship is from heaven. Are we all agreed on that? When you got born again, you did not get born again from this earth. You got born again from above. Amen. God wants a church. If you say, I want the vision of new life. Well, let me tell you something. After this vision happens, all the buildings and everything are going to happen get built. But the vision of new life is to bust such a hole over this town through the demonic princes that have just held a lockdown in this town to where anybody, anywhere can come and get what they need. You need a miracle for your marriage? Just come. You need your baby healed? Come. And you say, you can promise that? No, I can't. But I know the heaven that can. Amen. How did Elisha know the, that the horses and chariots fire 
could come from heaven and visit earth, he knew from his predecessor. It's super, super important that we begin to study revivals that have happened. Be and you say, why? Because we don't, you cannot have faith for anything you don't have an image of. If you don't have an image of healing, you can't get healed. If you don't have an image of what a move of God looks like, how do you believe for it? I've been reading a book by Will, about uh, William Wilberforce, and that biography has just stirred me because he and a group of men took eight, England in the 1800s where the slave trade was rampant. They, they stopped the slave trade. They took them his whole life and they got it stopped. There was something called bull baiting. The, the cruelty to animals just awful. People, the, <laughs> prostitution in London was unbelievable, right? Drunkenness, no schools. He got to the upper echelon of English society and said, this is not Christian. They said, we're Christian. They said, you're not acting like Christians if you have all this wealth and you're not helping the poor. Yeah. And in one generation, he turned the mindset, <laughs> the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals <coughs> was birthed through his group called Clapham. They call them the Clapham sect. They weren't a sect. They were a group of Christians that changed the mind of England and America by, uh, vicariously, okay? Yeah. Well, the way we think, if we're blessed, we have to help somebody. That whole thinking came through one group of Christians who used their lives to change the thinking of the nation. And I, well, it's documented in that book. I will buy that book for anybody who will read it. That's on my heart. You say you wouldn't. I said I will. Because if we get into our understanding that a group of Christians could change a nation, certainly we can change a community. Certainly we can change King George and West Marlin counties. Hallelujah. Good. Somebody has to introduce you to the miraculous, mm -hmm. to the divine possibilities available to us, to God. I shared with you last week, and I won't go into detail, but when I got, before I got, I didn't think the baptism of the Holy Spirit was for, for now. And you said, why do you talk about it so much? Because when you are born of the Holy Spirit, you have a measure of the Spirit. But John the Baptist in every single gospel said, I baptize you in water, but there's one coming after me who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all record that. When Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Spirit, he doesn't give you just a measure. Can you bring me that on? There's a pitcher of water over there. I'm not sure if I was going to use it or not. Now, this is my water to drink, so I'm going to use all of it. But when you get born of the Spirit, Okay, how many of you are born again? You know you're born again, you know something happened to you. Okay. When you're born, you can cut it right there. Thank you very, very much. When you're born again, you're born of the Spirit, and you are as much a child of God that you can't get any more saved. But Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, when you're born again, you have a measure of the Spirit. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, okay, when we go to baptize y'all, what, two weeks from today, a number of people that aren't here actually today, but they're going to get baptized, you are not going to get sprinkled. Mm -hmm. And I'm not against sprinkling, but it's not what the Bible says. The word baptize means don't. If they, in, in the Greek, if a ship sank, they said it got baptized. It's a word that went, meant sunk or don't. When you get Baptized with the Holy Spirit. I understand that's the nice how God made water. It will evaporate. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are so full of the Holy Spirit, you can't keep Him to yourself. Before I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I was saved. And I never talked to one person about Jesus and didn't want to. Thank you. But when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, no matter how hard I tried to keep Him to myself, I'm so happy people were asking me, What's going on? Isn't that the truth? The other thing I want to tell you about getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, you said, when did that happen in Acts chapter 2, 120, and we're waiting on God, and God came from heaven and more than filled them with the Holy Spirit, filled them to overflowing. Now, before I got the baptism, I really didn't think miracles were real, and I wasn't really impressed with the power of God. I've been in church all my life. I love God. I figured I was going to heaven. I prayed the prayer. I didn't live right, but I prayed the prayer. I was saved, but I wasn't living right. 
And then one day my grandma called and told me about two miracles that are not astounding miracles. I've got a book that doc they've documented limbs growing out. Now those are miracles. My grandma got healed from psoriasis. I've known her to have for over 20 years. That's huge to me because she's a stretch. My grandfather got ra delivered from racism. And if you don't think that's a miracle, I've, I've had spent many hours trying to rationalize with him. It's illogical the way he thought. That didn't help when God filled him with his love. Out went the racism and in with the pot, you know? Now here's my point. It did not take mega miracles to impress a 19-year-old. There's a living God, and I better get right. But it will take some kind of miracle to impress your friends that are laughing at God. Yeah. They just need to see the reality of God in our lives, and they need to see the fact that He answers prayer. He wants to do that. I mean, if He didn't want to do that, then why would Jesus come and just heal whole thousands of people at once? That's who He is. Now, say this with me. Spiritual things are real. And the spiritual realm is real. And then say, I am a spirit. If you go to 2 Thessalonians, I think it's 5.23, Paul says, I pray that God will sanctify you, spirit, soul, and body. Now here's the point. You have three parts to who you are. Spirit, soul, and body. I heard Mark Hankins make this point. It was so important. You're not a third spirit. He said, a lot of people think, well, I'm a one-third spirit, one-third soul, one-third... No, 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 no. You are 100% wall-to-wall spirit, having a computer and emotions, that's your soul, and living in a body. Now, here's my... Now, does everybody get that? Spirit, soul, and body. You are a spirit made in the image of God. John Ford, Jesus said, God is a spirit. Those are right. How many of you are a spirit? That's who you are as a spirit. If your spirit leaves, that doesn't mean you die. It means your body falls over with dead. If you are a Christian, you've already done all the dying you're going to do. The old man died. The new man was raised to life. And when, if at this moment I died, I wouldn't experience death. I would split from my body, drop my body I don't need anymore, take my soul with me, and I would go to heaven. I am a spirit. And you say, why are you making such a big deal out of this? Because people have the idea they can't re relate to the spiritual realm when that's who you are. Right. You were made like a fish is made to swim in water. You were made to operate in the spiritual realm. When Adam and Eve died, they died spiritually. They were cut off from God, and they got down in their heads. Most of us live out of our heads and our emotions. Our emotions go like this, and our heads think a lot, but our hearts know God. Right. Now, if you're brilliant, and I know there's brilliant people in here, we've got engineers, lots of brilliant people in here. We're not dissing your mind. Thank God for a fine mind. But you're going to relate to God out of your heart. Hallelujah. Now, you are a spirit, have a soul, living in a body. If you're a spirit, would it make sense to you that you could relate to the spiritual realm? Yeah, you relate to this. Boy, this is really hard. Mm -hmm. Because you think, well, this is hard. No, it is not hard to get an answer from God. Um, Nancy, you got a miracle when you were in the hospital down there in Florida, didn't she? Thank you. This is Nancy Brown. She called our prayer chain, and she got, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her, thought she might be dying. Within two, two, two days, you're up and around and doing fine. That's God. Amen? Amen? So all of us have had times in our life where we pierce what we think is an iron barrier to get help from heaven. But God wants is for us to be able to communicate with heaven that if you've got a kid who's going through a rough time, you say, sit down and let's pray. We will get you some help. Amen. Like, That's an exciting answer. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. I'm glad you're here. Let's get this great. <laughs> Let me ask you this. If you're a spirit, would it make sense that you can relate to the spiritual realm? Yes. yes. Could you open and close doors in the spiritual realm? Yes. Yeah. You're doing it all the time. The person who gets on a pornography website that they should never be on, you are opening a big door to the devil and said, come and get me. I'm saying, you're being mean. I'm trying to tell you how real the world is that we work in all the time. Yeah. Billy Graham said this. He said, if you can show me a man's checkbook, I'll tell you what he loves the most. Right. Now, I want to say this. If you can show me a person's checkbook and their internet search history, uh -huh. I will tell you who they've been opening doors to, 
and who they've been closing doors to. You can slam the door on the devil to where you have a... The only reason, if this church does have an open heaven over it, it do you think it's, that's not arrogant, right? We get answers to prayer. If this church has an open heaven, it's because we have chosen to slam the door on lying and strife and everything that brings disglory, that is inglorious to the name of the gospel. We, we try very hard to slam the door on lasciviousness. In all the things that our culture embraces. We say, I'm sorry, but we're not of this world. Amen. We live differently. We will live holy without shame. Amen. We slam the door on the devil, and we open the door to God. You say, how do you open the door to God? You wake up in the morning, you acknowledge Him, and you worship Him. And you choose to do what's right, okay? If you will show me your checkbook and your internet history, I will tell you who you have opened the door to and who you have slammed the door on. And what I'm talking to you about today is what is the vision of this church? The vision of this church is to knock a barn door over this, this place in the spirit to where people who come get answers. Let me ask you this. Did the Lord Jesus Christ open and close doors in the spiritual realm? All the Okay, what happened when a, when a demon acted up in his service? Did he go, oh, and take over the service? No. no. He said, shut up. Get out of here. Amen. He closed the door to the devil. Amen? Amen? When the storm tried to drown the disciples, what did he do? He said, peace, be still. He closed the door to the devil. What's it? Close the door to the devil. Close the door to the devil. How many of you have ever, at one point or another, saw the devil doing something and said, no, in Jesus' name? You've done it at least once, right? So you know it's possible. Did Jesus open doors? Yeah. He opened doors for the blind to see. He opened doors for the, for the lame to walk. I mean, there was nothing, no door that he couldn't open if that's what you needed. Did he open a massive elephant door to God the Father for God the Father to move on planet Earth? Yes. Yeah. Go back to Elisha. Why were the horses and chariots of fire? We think, well, it's the sovereignty of God. Now listen, I know God is sovereign. But God was so sovereign, he put a covenant into motion that let every single human being decide, I will serve him or I won't serve him. I will live right or I won't live right. He is sovereign, but within his sovereignty, he has given the earth to the sons of men. Psalm 115 says, the heavens are the heavens of the Lord, the earth he has given to the sons of men. Your frame of reference, what you have authority over, is under your dominion, and you open doors and you close doors. The only reason that there were horses and chariots of fire around Elisha and that he didn't get killed was because of his old walk with God and his faith. Now, can you see that? Why did Jesus open doors? It's because of his walk with the Father. Hallelujah. Now, why am I being so blunt? If I'm to elaborate on the vision of new life, I can't just tell you about stuff we're going to do in the natural. Because what we're called to do is to be a place where people know if you come, you will get your life changed. If you come and you're living wrong, the Lord is going to give you the grace to get it cleaned up. Well, that got a lot of cheers. If you had part of your life that needed cleaned up, how would you like to have the grace to live right? Oh, come on. There's got to be one pisser sitting here beside me to have, a, have the grace to say no to the devil, right? God has no dream for this church that does not include miracles. Nope. And you say, why haven't you ever shared this before? Because I knew it wouldn't be easy. Aww. And do you know why it's not easy? Because the dream of this church includes a lot of prayer, Hallelujah. a lot of commitment, and a lot of sacrifice. Amen. If we're really committed to this dream, we can't go camping every week in the summer. And I'm not against anybody that's camping. I'm just saying, if we're committed, we're committed. <laughs> yeah. This is something that's got to happen. Miracles were an indispensable and inseparable part of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you love Jesus with all your heart? He's the best person in your life. I want to read it again. Miracles were an indispensable and inseparable part of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you could just pull all the miracles out, and he just walked around teaching, turn the other cheek, there would have been no authority to back his teaching. Miracles authenticated the fact that he was from the Father. Right. Yeah. 
And you say, why do you make sense? Because honestly, right now, if Jesus came at this moment, there are so many hundreds of thousands and millions of Americans that would split hell wide open. But, five minutes after they saw the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, they would give anything to go back five minutes and repent. And we can't give it to them at that time. At that time, it will be too late. But right now, if I know what woke me up, as a 19-year-old claiming to serve God but not really living the life, when I found out there was a right now personal, interactive God that would heal my grandmother, deliver my grandfather, and fill them with a joy I'd never seen them have, I thought, you know what, I think I better get right with God. Yeah. Scared the wits out of me. God, this is what God wants for this church. And you say, why haven't you told us before? Because I figured I'd get this reaction. That's fine. <laughs> but you know what? Church was never meant to be a social club. Amen. When you went to Jesus' meetings, he didn't see who wore the fanciest hat. Mm -hmm. Nobody wrote down in scripture who wore the fanciest hat. They told who got delivered, who got healed, yeah. who got their lives changed. Yeah. He's our example. We see a wall between heaven and earth, but Jesus never even saw a veil. When Philip brought Nathaniel to Jesus, you know, and he said, Oh, behold, an Israelite in whom is no guile. And he said, How do you know me? Oh, let's read it. It's John 1, 47. He said, I said, How do you know me? He said, I saw you on the fig tree. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. Now, this was a word of knowledge. We don't know what it meant to Nathaniel. Maybe he was sitting there praying, talking to God, asking when the Messiah was coming. Who knows what he was doing? But it meant something big to Nathaniel because Nathaniel said, How do you know me? He said, Okay, I saw you under the, or when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And look what Nathaniel said. You're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. Why did he say that? Because it was supernatural. Did you know you can have a supernatural word of knowledge for people? It's in, Second Corinthians, or it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14. God wants to use the church and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Why? Not to impress anybody, so, but so that five minutes after the Messiah comes, they're not screaming, oh, God, if somebody had told me. So that we can get them awake now, okay? Now look at what Jesus said, because Nathaniel super impressed that he saw him under the fig tree. He said, you're the king of Israel. Now look at what Jesus said. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? He said, you're going to see greater things than these. Now read this with me. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. How did the Lord Jesus Christ view his ministry of miracles as a constant communication of heaven to earth? Now, you may not have seen that. You said, well, there's some resident in Jesus. What Jesus saw, Jesus was a man. Right who was God, but who had laid aside all his powers. Okay, go to Philippians 2. It says he emptied himself. He certainly emptied himself of omnipotence, right? Yeah. Or, I mean, of omnipresence. He wasn't omnipresent. Yeah. He wasn't omniscient. When he told Nathaniel that, he knew by the word of knowledge. And of omnipotence. He walked as a man anointed, a prophet under the old covenant. Yeah. And he said, here's what you're going to see. When I'm healing people, you'll be seeing angels ascending and descending. You say, why do you make such a big deal of this? Because at some point, you and I are going to have to understand that heaven is just right there. Yes. And you say, oh, I don't believe that. You wait until your baby needs to be healed after a car accident and you'll believe it. Right. How many of you ever reached into heaven and got a miracle? Well, you didn't, Nancy. I know you did. You wouldn't be here. You say, well, why would I want to do that for somebody else? Because if they don't see a miracle five minutes after they see the Lord, You'll wish. You'll wish. Look at Luke 3. I'm going to show you really fast. We've got nine minutes. I quit at noon, which I know is a relief for everybody that doesn't all come all the time because you don't know if I should know the beginning. Luke 3. This is one of those. I can go till 3 this afternoon. You should be so happy I quit at noon. Because you say, why is this the vision of the church? Why is this the vision of the church? A lot of you have already enjoyed the vision of the church. Yeah. How many of you ever had your life changed in this church? You know, we've had people, you know. Yeah. 
Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, what happened? Okay, now I just want to ask you one question. Is it possible for heaven to be open? Okay, heaven was open. Next verse. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven saying, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the question, whose life opened the door to heaven that day? Jesus, his integrity, his affection, and adoration. Of you understand, Jesus' life opened a door. Can we agree with that? Can we understand that Elisha's life opened a door? His integrity and walk before God opened the door for God to deliver him. And you say, you mean I have to earn this? No, but you've got to walk with God. You've got to be washed in the blood and believe. Hallelujah. Every individual here qualifies to be a heaven-opening person. If you love God. Yes. And, if, and you say, well, how do you do that? You have to, you, this has to become important to you. Yep. Yep. It has to become to a place where not only is your salvation important, but it's so important for other people to know the truth before it's too late. The, okay, when I say, some of you are visiting, and I know you just think I'm making this up. We've got people whose lives are so transformed. Um, the guy who's doing security out there, hi Ben. He brought his family here because his little girl had cystic fibrosis and within six weeks she was healed because of his faith, because we told him. All right? Kristen, you wouldn't know Kristen from when she walked in. God bless you. You just can't imagine Kristen. We have seen lives turn around and transform because of the miracle working power of God. And you say, well, why isn't this good enough? Because we're still not at the place where the lost can't ignore us. I don't want this. I could care less. I never want to be a pastor. If you say, I don't like women pastors. I never like women pastors. <laughs> never wanted to have a woman pastor. Certainly never wanted to be a woman pastor. And you say, why are you up there? Because when my husband died, the Lord asked me to stay. And he asked me in no uncertain terms. He confirmed it through both of the men who were on the board. He confirmed it through the church. I would have had to walk. My dad asked me. My dad said, can you handle it if you fail? And I said, I'd rather go down trying to obey God than I'll always look back realizing I was too chicken to try. You know what I mean? The only reason I'm here is because I love God. Yeah. It's a miracle. We went from when my husband died being in a dilapidated storefront. He had just put the, the bid on a, a 7-Eleven type of building, an old high store. Yeah. These guys in the church, they renovated it along with lots of help from the ladies, I should say. I mean, everybody worked. It's a miracle. Yeah. Everybody in town said they're dead. The pastor died. It'll be gone in a year. And that was 17 years ago. <laughs> and when we outgrew that place, it don't look like we outgrew it this morning. So many people gone. But when we outgrew that place, God gave us a miracle in getting this church. We have seen miracles upon miracles and miracles. So it isn't like we don't believe in miracles. No. And you say, then why aren't you satisfied? Because God's not satisfied. No. This message didn't come from my heart. Right. Yeah. I have avoided talking about the future of the church that I see in my heart. Mm. I don't go around spouting prophecies all the time because lots of people prophesy. Right. But you know, there's a few people who are so accurate when they prophesy, I pay attention. Yeah. One of my dearest friends was late in Guatemala and she died in 92, about three years ago. And she said, Denise, I was praying for your church, and I saw people come to where you couldn't get them all in. It's on the dirt in a big distance, but they weren't mad they couldn't come inside because they knelt down on the property out there, and God was so strong they got miracles. I remember you told me, Crystal, the first time I really talked to you, you were sitting out there in the parking lot waiting for Elisha to come out of extreme, and you said, Pastor, I just got a miracle sitting out here in the parking lot. And I said, well, you're the first one because I don't prophesy this. <laughs> and you say, why, why would you be so far out there? Why can't you just be normal? I want to be normal forever. <laughs> when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in a, in a campus of evangelical, 800 evangelical kids, all of whom I knew because my dad had been vice president there, I worked in a register. I knew everybody. Come on. Now, there were three of us, I found out, that were filled with the Holy Spirit. The other two found me and said, we think you speak in tongues. I said, why would you say that? Because they said, we got it too, and we were just like you. <laughs> Crazy happy. All right? I want 
wanted to go back to being normal, part of me. I don't want to lose the joy. I didn't want to lose the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be abnormal on that campus. I stuck out like a sore thorn on my found God. I don't want to be a woman pastor. Who? I said, Lord, it's hard enough being a pastor, let alone, I have been a pastor's wife, and I know what they go through. Who would want to be a woman pastor? And he said, you know what? What kept me here? I wanted to go to Tulsa. I thought I wanted to go to Tulsa because I knew Nathan at the time was 13. Since then, he's been to ORU and back. I knew I wanted to go to Oliver Roberts University, and I said, when he goes to school, we'll be close. I'm going to Tulsa. That was my plan. And he said, what kept you here then? One thing. And I'd like to say it was my love for you. It was not. I didn't know you then. <laughs> I love the presence of God. And all of a sudden, in all my decision making, I asked God one question. Because he was so close to us. Because when Gordon died, everybody was praying. You prayed a cocoon of the presence of God around our family. It was still hard, but it wasn't like it could have been. It wasn't hell on earth like it would have been without that. All of a sudden, I said, God. I said, if I go to Tulsa, Will your presence be as near and sweet? And he didn't say a word because I've been out of the will of God. He knew. I couldn't go to Tulsa. I stayed because in the epicenter of his will is his presence. Hallelujah. And you say, well, why do you give a message like this morning that would be a powerful church? That, because that's the only way he'll let me off the hook. That's why i got to go home and talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm trying to make it? No, I didn't make any of this stuff. I can show you on paper, this church has done astronomical things for missions. Yeah. We have so many missionaries, we are their lifeblood. Not the only supporter, but their primary supporter, month after month after month. And you know why? Because there is a spirit of generosity on this church. The supernatural. And because you're generous, you're, your finances have been blessed supernatural. And it's all supernatural. And God, I said, aren't you happy, Lord? We're out here in the middle of nowhere, and we're helping missionaries and sending missionaries, and everybody thinks this church is remarkable. They're not happy. He's happy. We're not satisfied. Because the only thing that's going to get him, he wants a place that's so full of miracles that anybody that needs to walk in doesn't get their marriage healed. They can get their body healed. They can get their life hope restored, their joy of life back. Are you following me? Yeah. That's what I had to share with you, and I had a whole bunch more. Boy, I wish I had more time. But I want to tell you something. Heaven is just right there. And God wants an open heaven of your life. And one more time, and then you go ahead and get up and music team. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you say, why do you keep talking about it? If there are 50 churches in this close little radius, I can give you 49 that aren't telling anybody this morning. If that's what you want, I can give you 49 names. True. And I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying, why does one person just keep talking and talking and talking and talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because it is the next step. You will never fulfill the whole plan of God for your life without the baptism. He's the power. The Holy Spirit's the power you live by. And I am duty bound to tell you because nobody else is. And the last thing I want to say is, you see, is it scary to receive? No, it's not scary. It's the scariest getting saved. And you have to take two minutes. And from that point on, and okay, this, uh, that was the next, the last thing I was going to say. This is the last thing. <laughs> I had prayed for a whole bunch of people to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe a hundred, maybe more. I have never had one person come and say, I wish you hadn't done that. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Now, why do people laugh? Because getting baptized, listen, the second best thing that will ever happen to you in your life is not marrying your spouse. I don't care what Hollywood says. Hollywood, it, I believe in romance, but Hollywood deifies romance to make it the point of living. The second best thing that will ever happen to you after the new birth is getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I have to bear solemn witness to that because nobody else is. God bless you.